Good evening. Good to have you here tonight. Welcome. We have lesson eight out of the first ten lessons in Grace Notes Doctrine, <laughs> the 100 level, Doctrine 100. We're going to cover lesson eight tonight, the armor of God, blessing, and divine discipline, so or chastisement as it's called. So three items to cover and uh, one hour to do it. So let's uh, open with a word of prayer and then uh, jump right on the material tonight, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and the blessing we have tonight to review what we have studied. Father, to get our questions answered, to explore deeper uh, realms that uh, perhaps we want to learn more about. So, Father, we uh, commit to you our time tonight, and we thank you for being faithful. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Did you do the lesson? Yes. I haven't seen the quiz yet. I saw your quiz. All right. Did you not do the lesson? You're hoping to get the class tonight to get the quiz question answers. Okay, I got that. All right. Well, armor of God. Where's the armor of God found? Ephesians. Ephesians what? Ephesians 6. All right, the armor of God. I got the microphone up here, actually, from this morning. Will we not need it? All right. Thank you, sir. All right, armor of God. I enjoy this uh, portion, and uh, you'll have to I'll have to be cautious, otherwise I'll spend the whole hour on the armor of God. We won't get to uh, blessing or or divine discipline. Try to make it large enough to see. We don't have a screen capture working tonight. All right. So finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And we have the most comprehensive passage of the New Testament that details our armament and details our engagement in the angelic conflict, the soldier function that we operate under in the angelic conflict. And a lot of historical background here related to the Roman uh, legions, related to the Roman army, and uh, the equipment that they used, their various pieces of armor, Obviously, Paul had a great exposure to this and uh, used this as his illustration, used this inspired by the Holy Spirit to describe what we have, what God has provided us in our righteousness, in our faith, in our salvation, in our truth, in our gospel preaching, in everything that God has provided for us. We want to make use of those things in our soldier function as if the uh, those things themselves literally was our armament, all right? Now, we understand that it's a metaphor. We understand that it's being used figuratively, all right? We're not literally putting a helmet on our head, but we understand in the metaphor, in the language that's being employed here, that this does describe our engagement in the angelic conflict, in the uh, struggle, not against flesh and blood. That's why it's not a literal helmet or a literal breastplate, but against the rulers and the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we are doing battle not in the the physical realm. We're doing battle in the spiritual realm. And uh, our adversaries are the the fallen angels and the demons. I believe they're separate things. Your text kind of lumps them together. Um, But we are engaging in the uh, the false teaching of of these false gods. And uh, this passage will help us to do that. All right, so when it says be strong in the Lord, is that active or passive? Do you remember? If it's an active imperative or a passive imperative? It's a passive. Is that what you said? It is a passive voice. So that is, it's not up to us to make ourselves strong. It's up to God to make us strong. We are to be strengthened. All right? It's a passive voice. Allow him to strengthen us. And uh, that's why in the quiz question when it says a uh, Christian is completely responsible for building his own personal inner strength, courage, and determination for Christian living by being more productive in the Christian life. Is that true or is that false? It is absolutely false. We, are, uh, we don't do this to ourselves. God does this. All right? Let me put this up here where I can see it better. Let's slide this over. There we go. All right, you have a screen at least. We got that working right tonight. All right, let me get down through the rest of this. 
The basic emphasis in the Christian life, quiz question number two, the basic emphasis in the Christian life is not doing something, but, do you remember? Not doing something, but thinking something. Yes, very good, thinking something. And of course, thinking precedes doing. We don't want to limit uh, the Christian way of life entirely to thinking. Uh, Do we do any good if we're just thinking about it and don't do anything? (laughs) <laughs> right? That's the book of James for you. That's a hearer of the word and not a doer. And you can have all your thinking adjusted properly, but if you're not doing anything, I would then suggest that maybe you don't have all your thinking adjusted properly, that you actually have a maladjustment in part of your thinking process. And you may have a, a perception just fine, but it's the application part of the thinking that is that is maladjusted there. So in any event, we have that. All right. Uh, moral courage. Do you remember the definition for moral courage as he talks about being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might? Part of the, the text and the definition for that strength includes the moral courage. And I'm trying to find in the text where this comes up. I meant to highlight it. Maybe I can simply search moral courage. Here we go. Be strong from the present passive imperative of endunamao, a reference to inner strength or moral courage. When the scripture tells us to be strong, when the scripture describes men that are strong in the faith or believers that are strong in the faith, or think about the description of Apollos, he was powerful in the scriptures. Don't we want to be there? We want to be powerful in the scriptures. I may not bench press 300 pounds, but I want to be powerful in the scriptures, okay? And that's the, uh, the reality for the Christian way of life. So be strong is an imperative, but it's a passive imperative, meaning that God is the one that's going to do the work. We're going to receive the benefit of the work. We're going to allow him to strengthen us. I think this goes along very well with what uh, uh, you could have heard last hour in terms of strengthening your heart in James chapter 5 and the, the, uh, the uh, application there. All right. Success in battle is always based on moral courage. The present tense used here indicates that moral courage must be used continuously. I would agree with that. The passive voice shows that this courage is received by the believer from the Lord as a product of grace. And I would agree with that. It is a grace provision as he strengthens us, as we allow him to strengthen us. Remember, the key in a passive imperative is you must let it happen. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Let the, the, the uh, peace of Christ that surpasseth all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let his strength strengthen you. There's other applications there as well. This courage comes through Christian growth and maturity. I would agree with that. The, full, uh, the faith slash grace process for biblical perception and application. It's this next paragraph where we got the answer to your second quiz question about uh, not doing something but thinking something. Okay, And I colored it yellow as, uh, as I agree with it in its basic premise, but I would expand upon it and uh, just caution against limiting the uh, Christian way of life to a thought process. It's more than just how you think. Because if you're not doing anything about what you think, then I believe you have a flawed application, as I said before. Bible truth applied to life will include orientation to grace, a relaxed mental attitude, a capacity for personal and impersonal love, greater inner peace and happiness, a divine frame of reference. These are all ingredients of moral courage. Again, I would, I would tend to agree with the statements here in this paragraph that these are part of what happens when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a part of what's molding us into the image of Christ. That we are growing to the full measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. And so, yes, that includes an orientation to grace, a relaxed mental attitude, a capacity for personal and personal love. But you realize those are theological expressions that are coming as a synthesis of the New Testament. It's not actually an exposition of, uh, of Ephesians 6.10. There's an awful lot that's being poured into be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Okay, And I don't dispute any of it. I think it's valid. But you have to build that case from other passages of Scripture. In other words, other passages of Scripture that speak about our grace orientation. And then ask yourself, can we correlate that to an imperative of be strong? 
And I think that's a legitimate exercise. And we say, well, does, does strength equal orientation to grace? Does strength equal a relaxed mental attitude? Does it equal a capacity for personal and impersonal love and so forth? All right? Am I making sense tonight? Everything in that paragraph I don't dispute, but I believe you've got to do a lot more work to, to see it in Ephesians 6.10. Because Ephesians 6.10 is a pretty short verse in Greek or English or anything else. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. It's not a verse that has orientation to grace, relaxed male attitude, capacity for personal and personal love. You see what I'm talking about? And so we're comparing Scripture to Scripture. We're putting these concepts together. And I think it's valid. I think it's valid, but you have to build that in the Scripture itself. And um, Otherwise, you're just kind of accepting the the curriculum for what it says there and and swallowing it as written. All right. Uh, These are all ingredients of moral courage, and I don't dispute that. Um, Understand it's in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Not in yourself, not in your own wisdom, but in the Lord. And, And we've discussed this in other classes as well. What is the reality of our positional truth of being in Christ and Christ in us? The Lord is the source of our strength and our training. In the power of his might. Anyway, I found this to be very enjoyable. Phrase by phrase, explaining each of these, each of these realities. Um, in the power, the instrumental case of kratos, meaning inner power or self-discipline, of his might, his iscuse. It's kind of fun to actually just go through this passage and find all the words for power that are here. Be strong, strength, might. All right? And, and it, you realize how intensified this, uh, this passage truly is. This takes us back to Ephesians 5.18, reminds us of the necessity of the Holy Spirit's control. All right. So when Scripture tells you to be strong, do we have other passages besides this that tell us to be strong? Passages we've had in other classes perhaps? Be strong? What was that? We have, yes. Yes. Finally, be strong, act like men. We had that in in, uh, 2 Corinthians, if you might remember. All right. Quiz question number three is, what are some of the ingredients of moral courage? I already answered that because it's from the uh, paragraph there. Orientation to grace, a relaxed mental attitude, occupation with Christ, the items that are listed there. Question number four, what is the source of our strength and training? It's the Lord. I tell you, if you try to find strength somewhere else besides the Lord, you're doomed. Okay? It's like the hymn we sing, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Okay, And uh, that is so true. Quiz question number five. Now that Christ has died, Satan and his forces are much weaker than ever. It's interesting. The technical answer to that question is false, but I believe it's worth additional instru- uh, description and instruction. Uh, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we have four different ranks of fallen angels there that we're dealing with in the angelic realm. Now, the quiz question, I think, is based upon a premise that comes from another passage, not the passage here in Ephesians 6. I think it's a concept that comes out of Colossians, that he disarmed the rulers and the authorities, that he triumphed over them in the cross. All right, are you familiar with that passage? You know what I'm talking about? That he, the, the, the God made a public display over them, he triumphed over them, that in the cross he disarmed the rulers and the authorities. So if they are disor- disarmed, why do we have such a tough conflict? <laughs> Why do we even need armor if they're not even armed? All right. And, uh, and I think that's legitimate. I think that's worthy of additional discussion beyond the material that's found in our uh, curriculum here tonight. But I think there's a concept there that, that's involved with what uh, Jesus Christ accomplished in the overall strategic victory, but still what we have to deal with in the day-to-day tactical operations of, of our combat. And we realize that Jesus disarmed those, the rulers and authorities, but boy, we, we, we rearm them all the time. We give Satan all the tools he needs to tear us down. And why do we do that, right? Because we're morons. <laughs> because we're sinners. Because we, um, uh, I don't know why. You know, there's no good answer to that. It's one of those why rhetorical questions. So, uh, no, we do need to be armored up. And, uh, and I can appreciate the quiz question there. 
for what it's saying. I like the development here, the panoply. The panoplia is the Greek word for the whole armor. Uh, by the way, Ephesians 6 is not the only passage in the New Testament that addresses armament. First Thessalonians speaks of, uh, of an armament. It's, it's a much lighter armor. It's, I believe it's a preparatory armor. It's the armor of readiness. I think that's the armor we, we leave on at all times before we suit up in the panoply. Um, anyway, there's other uniforms that we wear. We have uh, weapons of our warfare for the right hand and for the left that's spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There are other passages of the Scripture besides Ephesians 6 that speaks of armament, but this is the panoplia. This is the full armament. This is uh, when we know that we are in ranks, that we are in formation, that we are fully armored with the body of Christ. We are engaged in a a, uh, confrontational battle on the basis of this passage here. The other armament passages, I think, speak of readiness, speak of... Uh, you know, uh, the non-combat operations of a soldier. Anyway, I'm going to skip on down through this. The wiles of the devil, the methodea, Ephesians 6, the angelic terminology here. This is where the connections came in with Daniel chapter 10. And... uh, you know, it's interesting because in Daniel chapter 10, we've got Hebrew vocabulary. <laughs> um, we get into Ephesians and we have Greek vocabulary. And so where do we connect the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece? Uh, I accept that it's valid. I accept that, it's, that they represent fallen angels and that they represent satanic power behind the human throne. But how do we now bring it into the ranks that are mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 6? Are they in fact equivalent to cosmocrator. All right, I think that's worthy of consideration. But perhaps we should also connect them with exousias, or perhaps we should organize them with the, with the archon. All right? Um, I, I don't know that we can absolutely lock in the, the prince from, Ephesians, from uh, Daniel 10 to the cosmocrator of, uh, of Ephesians 6. Um, Anyway, may be worthy of consideration to evaluate that. Um, And if you were with us in the Daniel series or with us in the Angelology series, then that should have been very familiar with you as well. We're not talking about the human being, we're talking about the angels in that uh, that chapter. So uh, in question number six then, Prince of Persia is referred to A, a demon, B, the King Darius, C, Daniel, or D, the Greek general Alexander. It's A, and I would prefer to, rather than calling it a demon, I would prefer to call it a fallen angel because I do make distinctions between fallen angels and demons. Not every pastor does, but I do. Any questions on that? All right. Piece by piece then in the armament, the belt is the belt of truth. Question number seven focuses on the truth, the aletheia. This is the belt of aletheia. And... Uh, Obviously, the truth is the Word of God. It's the truth that sustains us. It's the truth that uh, Second Peter talks about that is all things necessary for life and godliness. There is nothing that we need to engage in the angelic conflict that we're not going to find written in the canon of Scripture, that we're not going to find provided for us through the revealed Word of God. I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, that that's all we need. It is abundant for everything we need in the Christian walk. Footgear of full preparedness. Footgear of full preparedness. You ever think about that? Why are shoes so important? Why are boots so important to a foot soldier, okay, to an infantryman, to a legionary from the ancient Romans, to the modern soldiers of today? Footgear is critical. And, uh, you know, bad feet, damaged feet, uh, trench foot, any of the things that happen if your feet get wet, if you're not changing your socks. You know, soldiers sweat. And if, <laughs> if you're in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever you are, and uh, you never change your socks, and day after day after day you're wearing the same sweaty, nasty socks, uh, you're going you're gonna to have some horrible feet conditions very quickly, and then you're useless in, uh, in uh, any kind of combat operations. Um, but the, the actual shoes themselves, the Caligula boots themselves, um, are connected to our preparation for giving the gospel. 
And in many respects, evangelism is the best armor we have. Evangelism is the best weaponry we have. You know, the more folks that we get saved, the fewer enemies we've got, (laughs) theoretically. All right? We don't want to make enemies out of one another. We don't want to make enemies out of the body of Christ. You ever think of it in those terms? You know, if you lead them to the Lord, you don't have to stab them. Figuratively. Metaphorically. (laughs) With the uh, sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. So... In any event, I appreciate that. So the, the uh, believer is uh, supposed to be prepared by putting on the foot gear of full preparedness. That's to spread the gospel. We ought to be ready. We ought to be eager to uh, give a defense, to give an account for the hope that is within us. I like question number nine. A, question, a Christian who does not want to take part in the conflict can relax and not worry about the consequences. <laughs> you can just opt out and say, excuse me, um, I, I choose not to participate. Well, no, we are all participating. You may choose to participate as a prisoner of war, all right, or an enemy prisoner of war, um, but we are all drafted in the angelic conflict. It's one of the, the blessings of being saved is that we have an ambassadorial function, a, a priestly function, and a soldier function. That's every believer in Christ. Yes, sir? Isn't that why we're in trouble as a nation is the christians who are sitting it out well that may be that's right we have christians that are not engaged in the warfare and i think it's reflected in in uh, our culture yeah and i'm not talking about trying to change or shape our culture i'm talking about christians that are surrendering in the angelic conflict and are pursuing the course of the demons absolutely right and when, when, when professing Christianity is just as fornicatingly immoral as, as the unbeliever out there, then what kind of armor do we have? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. All right. Combat is continuous. The emphasis of the verb is don't get caught without your armor on. And we put it on every day. We are continuously putting it on again and again and again and again. Take it up, take it up. Take up the whole armor. Ana lambano is the imperative. And uh, every day, you know, is there a day you're not going to wake up and put your armor on? All right. I like to tell people, keep your armor on. K-Y-A-O. Sometimes I close my emails and text with K-Y-A-O, which stands for keep your armor on. All right. Standing against the wiles of the devil. Why is the belt so important? Do you remember, do you remember reading through this? Yeah, the belt is kind of the linchpin for the whole suit. The belt, that's what the breastplate connects to. That's what your equipment's hanging on. Your sword is, your uh, um, sheath for your sword is on your belt. Everything is connected to the belt. So if you uh, abandon truth, what are you going to have for your armor? All right. All Christians are responsible to carry on personal witnessing. Is that true or false? Say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't have to evangelize. (laughs) Okay. It's like saying, I don't have the gift of giving. I don't have to give. No, everybody has to give. The uh, gift of giving is spiritually empowered above and beyond. The gift of evangelist is spiritually empowered above and beyond. But everybody should evangelize. I believe everybody should shepherd. You don't have the gift of pastor teacher, but you have a shepherding opportunity to your wife, to your children, to to, uh, younger believers. We all should be shepherding in, in one respect or another. Um, different different things there. Obviously, we all should be giving the gospel. Witness with your life. Witness with your lips. Who was it that said, uh, "Always give the gospel, and if you have to, use words"? It's a kind of a famous quote. Is that do you remember who said that? Yeah, it might have been Francis of Assisi. Okay. Anyway. To me, I I agree with you, I I seldom use that expression because I think some people uh, use that as the cop-out that, well, I'm going to just witness with my life and never say anything. No, we should say something. When that door is open unto you, be ready, be eager to give an account, and that's a verbal account. The soul of a believer is protected by... Yeah, the heart is not in the chest, the heart... Is the thinking capacity of your soul. And so the helmet. Did I miss that already? Nope, here we go. There's the shield. 
helmet. Here we go. I thought this was worth discussion. I'm already halfway through the hour and we haven't gotten to blessing or chastisement yet. Um, Receive the helmet of salvation and the sword provided by the Holy Spirit, which is the Word of God. Um, we should focus on the fact that it's not Logos to Theu there, it's Rhema to Theu. It's the Word of God, but it's not the the Word in general, it's the spoken Word specifically. It's the, it's the particular passage precisely. I think the Rhema to Theu needs a, a development all on its own. Not the Logos to Theu, the Rhema to Theu. Um, anyway, the uh, helmet, here we go. It is the soul which is said to be saved. So here's the helmet. The perikephalia, literally something placed around the head, the head wrap. Um, the soul is in the head. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? That's what it says. Is your soul in the head? What was that? Probably. Well, if it's not in the head, where else might it be? Think biblically. Think from the Old Testament. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. And life and soul are interchangeable. And uh, blood, in any event, okay, the soul is in the head. Well, is it? If you chop off your head, do you lose your soul? (laughs) I don't know. Uh, The soul goes to heaven, your head goes in the grave with the rest of your cadaver, but... Um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but okay, the helmet of salvation. Mentality, volition, self-conscious emotion. Um, and those are thinking, those are moral, those are uh, intellectual, those are uh, rational faculties. So I get the idea why we would associate. Some of this maybe is a philosophical thing as we, if you want to discuss the mind-body problem or you want to discuss uh, the, the connection between the brain and the mind and uh, discuss it you know, on, on a philosophical basis or a medical basis. Um, anyway, maybe I'm making a big deal out of something I shouldn't make a big deal of, but... Um, I just thought it was interesting. I will tell you this, though. I reject the sin nature uh, being a component of the soul. I'll tell you that right now. And I learned this from, from, I think I was five years old at a vacation Bible school, and I learned about mentality, volition, self-consciousness, emotion, and sin nature. I was even taught a song, a children's song, about um, those elements, okay? I think with my mentality, self-conscious side, my, oh my, I'm going to have to work on the lyrics now. Uh, The volition... uh, the con- oh, you know what's not on that list? Conscience. Conscience and is different than self-consciousness. All right? But the conscience is a facet of soul as well. And uh, my conscience tells me what is right and wrong. My self-consciousness tells me I am me. I think with my mentality. Okay? Um, anyway. But the sin nature is not a part of the soul. Reason being is your soul goes to heaven. Your sin nature does not go to heaven. The sin nature is in your body. It's in every fiber of your DNA. I believe the sin nature is the fallen nature in Adam that infests your body, not your soul. And uh, your sin nature will go into the grave when your body goes into the grave. So I colored that red just to separate it out. And then, yeah, I would add conscious, uh, conscience, conscious to... Uh, to that in addition to self-consciousness. Okay. Anyway, that jumped out at me. Great reference there to uh, Vegetius, I think, or Vegetius. I don't know how he pronounced it. Vegetius, I guess. I'm having a terrible time pronouncing tonight. Um, Anyway, great translation there about why they didn't swing their swords, why they thrust their swords. And um, anyway... Great quote there. The Romans made jest of those who fought with the edge of a weapon. They felt it was the puncture that would kill, not the not the slash. What's that? All right. Okay. Really, without a microphone, I'm not going to hear anybody sitting in this room. So, Uh, all right. Keep in mind, the architect who designed this room designed all the acoustics to go that way, <laughs> all right? And so uh, Molly's up here playing the piano. She can't hear anything coming through those speakers up there. And it's kind of a, an inter- that's why we put this little tiny little speaker over here, this monitor by the piano so you can hear what you're playing. 
All right, are we still dealing with uh, armaments? Any task can be done as unto the Lord. I would agree with that. All right. How can a Christian make every effort to give priority to the Word of God? Doing your work as unto the Lord means that your work must always involve giving out the gospel in some form, true or false. That's questions 13 and 14 here. Kind of had a side trip out of Ephesians chapter 6 and moved over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. But this, I think, is the uh, application with the Word of God. But I think it's slightly flawed because I would prefer, actually, if I was doing a development of Ephesians chapter 6, to emphasize the rhema to in Ephesians 6, not so much the, uh, the, uh, the logos. But that's all right. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 5, uh, 15, we all are to our workmen needing not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? And uh, spudazo, meaning we're to be uh, eager, we're to be diligent. My past, my childhood pastor always used to say, be studiously eager to present yourself, uh, approved unto God, workmen needing not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's why you're in Bible class. A workman, not a spectator. <laughs> Too many Christians think that we, we study the Word of God to be spectators, that we just come to learn, we come to know stuff. You know, I want to study because I want to learn something. I want to know something. No, we're not, uh, we're not uh, presenting ourselves before God as, no, as know-it-alls or presenting ourselves to God as people who know a lot of stuff, but as workmen, that we want to take what we know and put it to work. We learn as workmen, and we're all workmen. Uh, we're all in the ministry. It's not just the, the suit and tie that make the man the minister, right? We're all in ministry, and uh, we all are workers. And I, liked, I enjoyed these paragraphs here, whether you're a, a uh, guitar salesman or a truck driver or, or uh, whatever you are, you're, the work that you're doing is as unto the Lord, and you are a workman needing not to be ashamed. And I appreciate that. All right, any questions on that? That's kind of a side trip into 2 Timothy 2 related to the truth, related to the the Word of God. I think the better application of rhema, by the way, is uh, rather than logos, is it's it addresses specific passages of Scripture, specific applications from the Word of God. Jesus did this all three times in every temptation. If he was tempted with a food thing, what did he have? He had a Bible verse that applied, man shall not live by bread alone, okay? He didn't just pick a verse out of somewhere that didn't apply. He didn't just grab, you know, Jesus wept, that didn't apply. <laughs> grab a passage that applies. Have the Word of God ready so that you have a specific and precise application ready to go. If, uh, if it's a temptation for stealing something, well, then you have thou shalt not steal. If it's, uh, you know, another struggle with maybe uh, uh, not sure where uh, provision is going to come from, you have the Lord will provide, or uh, the battle is the Lord's, or whatever it is. Get an assortment of scriptures that you've memorized, that you believe, that you trust, that you live, and make those your rhema, the rhema to theu, the word of God that you apply to the test, that you pierce and puncture every time that little demon raises its head, that every time the little whisper comes in your ear that uh, you know, God's not providing for you. Just grab the Lord will provide and skewer that uh, demon, all right, with the, the rhema to theo, with the word of God. And uh, scour, uh, skewer those uh, demonic lies every chance you get. Okay, that's how you apply the, uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema to theu. All right, blessing. Blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And so here's a great passage in Ephesians 1.3 that has blessed and blessed and blessing. And uh, a good application here. But it's a, too bad we don't have the screen recording tonight. This would be useful. Nope. I don't have a mouse either. But I'm not complaining because the Lord will provide. All right. Let's just go with that. Eulagetas, eulageo, and eulagia. And so we've got blessed and bless and blessing. 
And uh, the fundamental concept here is to say a good thing. Like, think eulogy. There are three New Testament Greek words. Uh, we got eulogetos, eulogeo, eulogia, and then beyond that, there are the makarios terms, okay? The, the terms for happiness that are found in the, in the uh, Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. All right, but the idea of a eulogy. You're saying a nice thing about somebody. You're standing up to give a eulogy in a funeral, so you say something nice about the guy, okay? <clears throat> Would you say the nice thing if he was not dead? <laughs> All right. Um, are, you, are you forcing yourself to say something nice about the guy? Anyway, uh, when God says something nice about you, that's a good thing, right? Because when God says something, it happens. Think about God who blesses us verbally, but he manifests the reality when he says, let there be, there is. So when God pronounces, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased, there are tangible, physical experiential benefits that accrue to us in time and in eternity because God said so. I like that as a concept. I like that a lot as a concept. All right. So the word blessing is a direct translation from a New Testament Greek word that is false. That is absolutely false. And we should say eulogize or eulogy if we want to make it a direct translation. I guess, transliteration or bring it across. Um, We also have to uh, consider through usage that uh, most often when you talk to people about blessings, they're thinking about loot, plunder, stuff, things they have. And uh, they've been given a lot of things. They call those all blessings, okay? That, uh, well, I've got money or health or or things, or or whatever, friends or family. I'm very blessed. I have a nice church. I'm very blessed. Or and we think about blessings as stuff, tangible things. And uh, what we understand here, anyway, is uh, our blessings are spiritual, and they're in the heavenly places, and they're in Christ. So that does not include my money or my health or my wife or my children or my anything I can touch here on this planet. Because blessings are spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. All right. Anyway, it's a big study. The idea of a blessing uh, in terms of the sons trying to receive blessings from their father. Blessings, if we are to say a blessing upon a person. Of course, the opposite of blessing is cursing. It's the same tongue that will do both. The tongue can bless and the tongue can curse. We want to say a blessing. We want to bless one another. We want to bless God. Actually, we're going to give an account for every careless word we speak. That's a scary thought. Don't you think? Is that a scary thought? I think it's a scary thought. Showers of blessing. We sang that hymn this morning. All right. Your quiz questions on blessing. I already answered the quiz question 15. It's false. It's not a direct translation. Uh, Blessing comes from a mental attitude of what and what? Mental attitude of love and appreciation. See, a lot of... I think a lot of the issue, though, comes with respect to our capacity to identify God's blessings. That, that's maybe bigger than anything else, is identifying what God is blessing. Dan brought it up last hour as well. We ask God to bless what we're doing instead of doing what God's blessing. I think the, the capacity, we want to have the capacity to identify the heavenly blessings in Christ, the, the spiritual blessings that we have in the heavenly places in Christ. Those are our blessings. Other stuff that may happen in time, I think, is just special blessings, extra icing on the cake, if you will. Colonel theme called it special blessings in time, but um, I'm still looking. Cliff and I have a little side project we're working on right now, Pastor Cliff and I, trying to find a New Testament usage, okay? Not an Old Testament usage. You can, you can point to, you know, Abraham and his gold and his sheep and his flocks and his wealth and blah, 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 but a New Testament usage that connects blessings, eulogia, blessings, with uh, tangible stuff on this earth. Okay, and I'm still looking. 
to see if I can find it. Anyway. Uh, but love and appreciation, is uh, it's attitudinal. And I would agree with that. It's attitudinal to identify his blessings. God is able to bless a Christian as soon as that person makes up his mind to give everything to the Lord. Uh, yeah, see, we gotta, that's a false prosperity gospel approach that, well, if I, just, if I give, then God will bless me. And uh, the mechanical legalism of, of uh, God showering his blessings because I've, I've given. Even blessings are a grace provision. We want to understand that. We operate in grace. We, we function in grace. We receive grace. Even as blessings, they're grace blessings. God's blessing does not depend upon a believer's thoughts or actions. Truly is a grace application that is significant. All right. And then chastisement. Your last two questions are on chastisement plus the essay question is on chastisement or divine discipline. When God disciplines, when he chastises a Christian, his objective is, before I move on to chastisement, any questions on blessing? Thoughts on blessing? Comments on blessing? You want to shake your fist and tell me I'm wrong? Blessings uh, are tangible. <laughs> you want to, uh, if we can get into a knockdown, drag out fight here tonight? And say, well, I, uh, I love my children. My children are a blessing. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I think that the privilege you've had to train up those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is a blessing. And the fellowship you may have with adult sons and daughters that can have the capacity to identify with the will of God, with the word of God, the fellowship you have is a blessing. See, you see what I'm taking? But the, the physical existence of, of making babies, wait a minute, okay? Maybe I'm painting with too fine a brush at this point. Say, well, my Mustang is a blessing or whatever, okay? Um, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about what he's provided. But understand, when he does provide with the capacity that he does provide in terms of wealth, in terms of health, in terms of prosperity or adversity or whatever else, the circumstances and conditions he places us under become the field of testing. All right, are we going to stay faithful? Are we going to stay faithful at this income level, at this income level, at this income level, at this income level? At what tax bracket do you abandon the Word of God and just give up on God and become a uh, a lover of this world. Say, when do you blow it in the in the prosperity test? I believe every every uh, sc- you know the, within the proportion of what he has provided, it's not a blessing. It's an assignment. It's a test. There's a purpose for why he's given that. So stay tuned. At some point, Cliff and I will quit our musing and actually present a uh, a uh, completed study on that. All right, divine discipline then. We've got 13 minutes for divine discipline. Does God punish us because he's mad? <laughs> Is it an emotional thing with God? And, and neither should it be with us when we discipline our children or when we discipline a, a church member or any kind of discipline. It's not supposed to be in anger and it's not supposed to be punitive and it's not supposed to be destructive. The goal is repentance. The goal is correction. The goal is to restore a brother. And uh, the purpose for discipline is to restore. And uh, something else I heard last hour in the, uh, the book of James. It is restorative. So his uh, question number 18, his objective is to restore that person to fellowship. The whole point of discipline is to win your brother. And that's why you take it in stages in the outline of Matthew 18. That's why you approach him, first of all, one-on-one. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. And you don't go to step two or three or four. You stop with whatever step it is that achieves the objective. Suffering is always removed as soon as a Christian confesses his sin. (laughs) Boy, that would be easy confessionism, wouldn't it? Just get back in fellowship and all your suffering is immediately over. No. In many cases, we face the consequences of our carnality for months and years later, for the rest of our life sometimes. There's carnality that 
sometimes, uh, you know, the consequences that go with it. Lifelong in, in some respects. Now, here's the, here's the key, though. When you confess your sin, and he forgive, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The consequences may not go away and the suffering may not go away, but you're now in fellowship with a divine viewpoint perspective to where you can view the chastisement you're under in a positive way. You can view it as a blessing. You can view it as a growth opportunity. You can view it as an object lesson. You view it as a benefit for the Father who makes it as unpleasant as it is he does that in love training us to not want to do that again (laughs) all right and you realize hmm that's no fun i don't want to do that again because the next time it'll be worse i reached a certain point in my life in my ill-spent youth where i I didn't want to know what the next step was going to be because i was sick and tired of what the current step was all about i was kind of afraid of what the next step might be it's the benefit to his divine discipline. So no, it does not mean like, oh, David faced those consequences for the rest of his life. It, it actually affected his children and their generation because of the consequences of his, uh, of his sin. All right, then for your essay question, it says, explain how a Christian can avoid chastisement. Can you avoid divine discipline? And then... Uh, also explain how a Christian is restored to fellowship after a period of carnality. And I think what's interesting is this recovery process. The restoration of fellowship is instantaneous. The forgiveness is, is absolute. But the recovery time in order to rebuild and to grow, I believe that is a, a long process to occupy with Christ, to live in the Word. I think that there's a season... Well, this gets into a lot of other things too. National chastisement. There weren't any quiz questions on that, but your text had some applications there. Let's just keep it on a personal basis now. To uh, recover from carnality, to recover from prolonged carnality, to recover from serious soul damage that has been done in the meantime because of the prolonged darkness. Does that just all go away as soon as you first John one nine and get back right with the Lord? No. There's actually some training that has gone on that needs to be untrained. Things that need to be unlearned. Thought processes that need to be renewed. And, uh, and I agree that the occupation with Christ and abiding in the Word is the, is the way to do that. That's, uh, those are the imperatives for how we, uh, how we renew our thinking. So if, you, uh, if you've got a loved one or somebody you know, and, and yeah, they're saved, they're going to be in heaven forever with us, but man, they've not been under teaching for, for years. It shouldn't shock you that they're just as worldly as the unbeliever. They've got all the attitudes, the philosophies, the thought processes. Uh, on, a, on a thinking basis, on a practical lifestyle, what, what's, what's the difference between them and the unbeliever? None. Zero, distant, you know, zero difference at all. If you didn't know their background or, ha- or if you don't remember the past testimony of their regeneration, you might even have cause right now to doubt their regeneration. Because you're not presently seeing the fruit. Say, good thing we got our memories. <laughs> and we can think back to that day. Go, yeah, I, remember. I remember a season when you were hungry. I remember a season when you bore fruit. I testify to your regeneration. I'm not going to doubt it now. I know it's real. But I also know that when you're not transformed by the renewing of your mind, the Romans 12 consequences, you're going to be conformed to this age. And age conformity is, is uh, it's the, it's, it's common. It's, it's probably the majority of Christendom right now is age conformed, and that shouldn't shock us. Shouldn't shock us at all. All right. Any questions on chastisement, divine discipline, how God wakes us up? Get a microphone over there, please. There we go. Um, my. My mind is thinking about the word discipline, and not in a spiritual sense, but I'm confused a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, as a coach, I used to discipline the uh, basketball players con- in a conditioning way. It was a good mm-hmm. thing. Uh, a runner needs to have the discipline to get up early and, 
and run. Uh, tennis player has the discipline to hit so many balls, you know, you know, repetitive in a disciplined way. Mm-hmm. Um, can you discriminate a minute with divine discipline and chastisement and God's testing to where he's he's trying to bring out the, the believer sees things as sometimes as well this is bad mm-hmm. well and I didn't sin mm-hmm. so it's kind of like conditioning you, you take take the the scenario as I said and right. kind of put sp- those spiritual words uh, divine discipline divine uh-huh. chastisement uh, yes and I would I would distinguish between divine discipline and undeserved suffering. All right, there's deserved suffering and undeserved suffering, and and God uses both. He uses both. Job, for example, did not deserve what he went through in, in the undeserved suffering of of his afflictions from chapter one and from chapter two. I believe later in the book of Job he did come into des, uh, deserved discipline uh, for much of the fault finding and the blame that he that he fell into in in later chapters. Um, I think uh, the, the, the discipline you're talking and that's the thing, in English we use the same word discipline to refer to our, our self-discipline and how, how we, uh, we regulate our, our behavior and our diet and our exercise and, and some people, and, we're, and scripture does the same thing, we're to live a very disciplined life and not go about like busy bodies, right? And so the idea of being disciplined, personally self-disciplined speaks to that regimentation and that conditioning and, and that as opposed to anything that's corrective and punitive and, and um, uh, that's assigned in a, in a negative way to, to wake us up. And so it might be, um, it might be useful for us to, to avoid the confusion there by, by uh, finding separate terms other than a term like discipline that can be used ambiguously in that respect. Um, but you know what, what he teaches us in our deserve, divine discipline, our deserved suffering, is, uh, is, is we learn how to endure and we learn how to repent and we learn how to confess and be restored to fellowship. Um, we learn how to endure under sufferings, uh, things of that nature. We learn even more when it's undeserved. And if you think about Christ, he learned through the things that he suffered and not one thing did he deserve. Uh, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And in, in most often than not, that's what produces the character within us. When we serve the Lord anyway, we've been, we've been done wrong, but we keep serving the Lord. And, and I think that also speaks to our uh, regimented thinking and our personal life of, of sobriety when Scripture tells us to think soberly uh, in, uh, in that. That's the Titus passage you brought up earlier in this evening as well. So, yeah, good question. You know, sometimes, too, I've encountered folks that have come to me and church members and whatnot that have been um, very uh, uh, discouraged and and uh, have have uh, spoken about their undeserved suffering, and you think they're a modern day Job, you know, a 20th century Job or whatever. From and, and you just say, well, hmm. you know, and they're not they're not even honest enough with the Lord or themselves or anything to acknowledge the fact that they've got this long history of this sin pattern. And is there any chance at all that maybe you actually brought this upon yourself, that uh, you're facing consequences for the dumb choices you've made and, and, and the, actually the rebellion against the Lord in, uh, in different things? And oh, well, I didn't know you knew about that. Yeah, well, yeah, everybody knows about that. We just, we're not gossiping or talking about it. But, you know, um, don't come to me and act like it's all undeserved suffering when you and I both know for a fact that, that uh, this is what you're doing. So consider that uh, it may be divine discipline. Consider that it may be completely deserved suffering. Consider that in your recovery, you may need to take it to the elders and get them to pray with you and over you, James chapter 5, and uh, that by involving the leadership of your local church in your prayer recovery, that uh, you may actually be restored to fellowship and may uh, come through that season of repentance uh, sooner than otherwise, because as long as you keep you know, living in this denial reality, then it's, it's just going to continue and it's just going to get worse. So that's something else I've encountered over the years <laughs> in different ways. All right. You know, I also am, am cautious. If I see somebody go through something else, I would rather assume that it's undeserved and start praying for them. Um, if I suspect that maybe it's deserved, um, I'll pray more, but I don't want to assume 
like Job's friends, just show up and say, all right, what have you done? What are you going to repent of? Okay. I would, I would rather assume the innocence and then maybe be disappointed later when I learn otherwise. Uh, I don't want to assume the guilt and then be disappointed later when I learn it's all undeserved. <laughs> okay, if that makes any sense. All right. Well, next week, 109, and the week after that, 110, we've got two more weeks. Two more weeks to uh, wrap up um, Grace Notes 100, and then we'll have a two-week break. Uh, we will begin uh, systematic theology in September. So two more weeks for this, and then two weeks off, and then um, we'll resume uh, Geisler, Norm Geisler, in September. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your word. We ask for your blessing upon these students. Continue to bless their time and their diligence. We thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.